next. We're talking teams and some of the most decorated teams in Oregon sports history. The first national champion team at Linfield, the 1966 Wildcat baseball team. We'll take a look back at women's amateur softball and the Rose Cities team that made it to the national championship. And rare footage from the 1939 Oregon Tall Furs basketball team, known for winning the very first big dance. All this and more on Great Athletes, Great Oregonians. It's expected that great athletes should populate the exhibits in a sports hall of fame. In Oregon, entire teams are recognized for their unique contributions to the state's sports heritage. And this show is about those teams. Of course we featured the 1977 Trailblazers championship team on a prior show, but there's the 1958 Drain Black Sox known for... I'm not familiar with that one. How about the Irv Lynn Flores softball team? That's the 1964 Amateur Softball Association World Champions. Correct. And there are many others, but first we begin with a rare look at basketball that you probably haven't seen before. Cool footage from the 1939 University of Oregon Ducks and their march to the first ever NCAA title. The economic depression that gripped the country in the 1930s didn't stop Oregon's can-do spirit as local sports grabbed the public's imagination. The game of basketball was getting popular, but the rules of the game were still in development. For example, the ball was taken back to center court by the referee after each basket. University of Oregon coaches Hobby Hobson and John Warren shaped players from small Northwestern high school teams into the nation's best collegiate team in 1939. The Pacific Coast Conference Championship used to be a best of three affair, and Oregon beat California twice on successive nights to make the NCAA tournament. Then two days later, the team was on a train to San Francisco for the West Regionals. The day after arriving, the Tall Furs beat Texas 56 to 41, and then beat Oklahoma 55 to 37 to reach the national championship. At Northwest University in front of 5,500 fans, the Tall Furs, now called the Ducks, used their fast-breaking style, along with their knowledge of the game and each other, to beat Ohio State 46-33. They were the champs. Arriving back in Eugene, the 11 team members were celebrities, with parades and a large on-campus dance to celebrate the team's success. The Tall Furs were the best collegiate team playing basketball. And maybe it was here, in Eugene, Oregon, the term Big Dance was first heard. In 1964 to 1966, Linfield College in McMinnville, Oregon was the first NAIA school to play in championship tournaments for football, basketball, and baseball. Here's how the 1966 Wildcat baseball team dealt with tradition and tragedy on the road to a championship. Baseball had a long tradition of success at Linfield College during the decade of the 60s. Coach Roy Helser was a hometown hero as a player with the Portland Beavers, and his good name attracted outstanding talent to the McMinnville campus. After winning the Northwest Conference for seven seasons, the Wildcat streak was expected to end in 1966. The experts were wrong. Not only did Linfield win their eighth straight NWC pennant, they rode consistent hitting and excellent starting pitching all the way to the NAIA National Championship. The impetus for this drive to the title came one year before. Popular first baseman Jack Marshall died from injuries, suffered in a car accident while the Cats were playing in the West Coast Championship game. For the next 12 months, the unspoken mantra was, win one for Jack. After a slow start, Linfield won eight of their last 10 games to take the Northwest Conference. Roy Helser's team swung freely at the plate, and Jay Gustafson would set the pace with a 426 average. Alan Wells, John Lee, and Barry Stenlin all topped the 300 mark as well. Lee anchored the defense with some nifty glove work at shortstop, and it would take a narrow one-run win in the regional series with Westmont to advance to the NAIA World Series. 
After an exhausting trip on three different flights to St. Joe, Missouri, the Cats were in a no-nonsense mood. Linfield pitchers threw complete game after complete game. Stu Young won two all by himself. The Cats led all series teams in batting and team ERA, winning four straight games and the school's first national championship. The Cats finished 29 and six and were proud to defeat schools with much larger enrollments. Much like other Linfield teams over the years, many of these players went on to careers in education and coaching. The team from left field, Linfield, the 1966 NAIA baseball champions. Coming up, the story about an Oregon Sports Hall of Fame team winning some unusual awards on its way to a national championship. Great athletes, great Oregonians. From the Oregon Sports Hall of Fame is sponsored by Nike and by D.A. Davidson. Financial advice for the long run. Financial advice you can trust. The Oregon Sports Hall of Fame recognizes and celebrates Oregon's rich athletic history. It's built on the premise that the lessons of sport provide a unique opportunity for self-discovery. Through an extensive memorabilia collection and exciting interactive exhibits, the hall teaches and reinforces character and values. Each year, the hall commits to lifelong rewards in the form of scholarships awarded to high school student athletes. Contact us about this process and the annual induction ceremony at your Oregon Sports Hall of Fame. They were called the Black Sox, but there was nothing scandalous about their performance. In 1958, the drained Black Sox from a town of less than 1,200 became the first town team to win the National Baseball Congress Championship. My name is Mel Krause. Early in the 1950s, I played for the Drain Black Sox. Now, how did the Drain Black Sox come about? Well, in the late 1940s, Harold and Donna Woolley, owners of the Woolley Logging Company in Drain, traveled to Portland frequently to watch the Portland Beavers play. Harold and Donna were also con considering ways they could improve the recreational program in the city of Drain for the children of their employees. Harold called a mutual friend, Bud Horn, to see if he could arrange a meeting with Roy. This meeting took place, and as a result of that meeting, Dorothy and Roy Helser moved for the next six summers to Drain, Oregon, to run a baseball team and to run a recreational program. Harold and Donna hired Ray Stratton, who was the local high school baseball coach, to run the team. Ray ran that for the next four years. Well, in 1958, they hit the jackpot. They won the National Baseball Congress World Championship, played in Wichita, Kansas, the first team from Oregon to ever accomplish that. In the late 1930s, Roy Helser, Don Kirsch, Dick Whitman, John Bubalo, and the Arab brothers played for the Silverton Red Sox and finished third in that tournament. Congratulations. This outfit was the most unique bunch of guys you ever played ball with. We worked every day together, we traveled, we lived at the lovely El Camino Motel, we ate sumptuous meals at the Tasty Freeze. We couldn't ask for anything more. One of the things I'd like to say is thanks to, to Don and Harold Woolley. They, they made our lives so easy by giving us jobs and a, and a being in the summertime to go play ball and be student athletes. And to them, I say thank you for our educations and for teaching us a lot of lessons. The Oregon Sports Hall of Fame has an incredible, outstanding collection. Included in the collection, uh, the 1942 Rose Bowl Trophy. Oregon State beat Duke 20 to 16 in that game. And Katie, what was interesting is that game was played in Durham, North Carolina during World War II, and they played it on the East Coast, the only game played on the East Coast because of a fear of attack on the West Coast. In the 1960s, the hockey-playing Buckaroos owned Portland. 
A ticket to a game in brand new Memorial Coliseum was just as prized as a Blazers ticket is today. The 1960-61 team stunned the hockey world by finishing second in league, marching through the playoffs, and bringing home the cup. And this is Portland, situated at the confluence of the Columbia and Willamette Rivers. A lush green virtually the year round, the rose capital of the West. It's the only city on record to have been named by the toss of a coin. It boasts the world's largest shopping center, the only extinct volcano within the confines of a North American city. The first elephant ever born in captivity was born here. Its water is so soft and pure, it can be used undistilled in storage batteries. And here in its glass palace can be found the winningest hockey team of the past decade, the swashbuckling Portland Buckaroos. One of the league's charter members, Portland took a nine-year hiatus after its third season. Returning to competition in 1960, the talented Bucks have never finished lower than second in the season standings. Seven times they led the pack, an unprecedented five times in a row. Through the past 10 years, they have notched more victories than any other team in any organized professional league. Normally, hockey is a physical game with more muscle and conversation in evidence. There are occasions, however, when one of the principals will get on the speech. To no avail, of course. The Buckaroos have always possessed two of the major ingredients for success in hockey, physical strength and matchless finesse. They are at the same time the league's finest slate of hand practitioners. Traditionally, they take fewer shots on goal, but still put the bun in the oven more times than any of their contemporaries. Their percentage of shot conversion is little short of awesome. Under the circumstances, like the Yankees of old, the Buckaroos are pointed for more perhaps than any other club. An extremely proud team, they like it that way. If a dynasty can be described as a, as a series of success over a period of years, then this team launched one of the few dynasties in the history of sports in Oregon. In their 13-year history, the Buckaroos won the league championship eight times and the Lester Patrick Cup three times. During that span, the Buckaroos won more games than any team in professional hockey. The runners-up were the Montreal Canadiens. It is an appropriate honor for this team to be inducted and enshrined in the Oregon Sports Hall of Fame. Financial relationships built on loyalty. I think there's uh, one message I'd like to leave with the viewers, and I think it reflects um, my life, and it certainly reflects uh, some of my mentors, and it's a short piece of prose that, uh, that I'd like to share, which goes as follows. Begin with a vision and hold it fast. Reality passes, but great dreams last. In time, wit and work will open the doors to give form and body to those dreams of yours. Begin with a vision and follow it through, for that is the way great tomorrows come true. So I think that uh, it's basically saying to us, uh, have a vision, know who you are, what you want to do, and go for it with all you got because it's going to take work. But don't stop dreaming for that next step and work hard for the next one after that. And uh, I think that's my message. 
The 1965-66 Oregon State basketball team was picked to finish no better than 500 in conference play. The Beavers started out with a 75-39 loss to UCLA. They reached the Elite Eight and came that close to playing in the Final Four. They were the underdogs of underdogs. But Oregon State's 1966 basketball team was bound to spend one amazing winter confounding the experts on a run to the final eight of the NCAA tournament. The Beavers were still in transition two years after the retirement of coaching legend Slatskill. Mel Counts and Jim Jarvis had led the Beavers to three straight postseason berths at a final four appearance with no star and little experience. No one expected much of this team. They were picked no higher than fifth. But Paul Valenti had a plan. Spread the scoring around, concentrate on defense. After a 1-3 start to the season, the Beavers finished December with a flourish, winning the Far West Classic and holding all three opponents under 50 points. That set the tone for a team that blew through the conference schedule 12 and two. OSU set a school record that still stands today, allowing an average of 54 and a half points per game. Sophomore Lloyd Peterson emerged as the leading scorer at 13 per game. Walk-on junior center Ed Friedenberg was the top rebounder and senior captain Charlie White the 25-year-old community college product held the whole thing together, winning All-America honors. The Beavers finished the regular season with a 14-point whipping of Oregon in front of a full house there at Gill Coliseum. Then learned of their terrible first round NCAA matchup. It was the Houston Cougars and big man Elvin Hayes, one of the favorites to win it all. Playing in Los Angeles, the Beavers stunned the highest scoring team in the country, holding the Cougars 40 points under the team average and limiting the Big E to just 14. Rick Whalen led the Beavs with 24 points and OSU had pulled the upset 63-60. Delirious and exhausted following that win, there wasn't much left in the tank the very next day against Utah. The Beavers ended their season with a loss, but the 21-7 record and postseason run earned this Beaver team a place among the best of any Oregon State sport in school history. The lessons these inductees are sharing have the ability to impact all of us. High school student athletes are absorbing the lessons they see every day. With me now is Elijah Greer, Lake Oswego High School, cross country, track and field. You run the 800 meters, the 1500 meters. What's your biggest accomplishment? Last year, I set the national junior class record for 800 meter dash. And um, that was a real eye-opening race for me. It was a new experience and it kind of helped bring me to the next level of competition. Uh, with when I do running, it takes a lot of mental focus, a lot of preparation, and before each race, I have to you know visualize the outcomes, the result, and it all kind of you know brings my success. And I, with that, I can transfer that to other areas of my life. When you talk about track and field, I mean in other sports, there's a team element, and in, in running, you're really out there alone, aren't you? I mean, and in, in you're by yourself. What about running? Can you take into other parts of your life? It's a lot of kind of just discipline. It's doing the work putting your time in and then seeing your results. And that's just something that I can carry over in almost any aspect of life is when you, when you enjoy what you're doing and you're having fun, but you're also you know, working hard, then when you see that success, when you see those results, you're like, you know, this is a lot of fun, you know, this is something I'm good at. And then it just kind of motivates you to do even more the next time. When you look at the Oregon Sports Hall of Fame, you've got Steve Prefontaine, you've got the great history at the University of Oregon in track and field, you'll go there to run. What's that gonna be like for you? You know, I haven't been there yet, but uh, I'm definitely excited about it. I think there's great coaches, uh, Vin Lanana, Andy Powell, and I think those guys will help develop me and they'll help take me to the next level, and I'll be around a lot of great influences, guys that will help you know, support me and bring me on. Because most, most kids, you say, hey, you have to go run, and they go, oh, they dread it. I mean, you, you love it? You love to run? Um, it's something that kind of channel my energies. Uh, it's a passion. Uh, you know, at first, you could almost say running shows me because I had so much success with it, but I've... 
learn to, you know, go through the good days and the bad, you know, the good things and the bad things. All right, good luck to you. Thank you, Leisure. Up next, the backing of a Portland florist. Good chemistry and determination all contributed to these ladies setting the softball world on fire. That's next on Great Athletes, Great Oregonians. Financial advice you can trust. The Oregon Sports Hall of Fame recognizes and celebrates Oregon's rich athletic history. It's built on the premise that the lessons of sport provide a unique opportunity for self-discovery. Through an extensive memorabilia collection and exciting interactive exhibits, the Hall teaches and reinforces character and values. Each year, the Hall commits to lifelong rewards in the form of scholarships awarded to high school student athletes. Contact us about this process and the annual induction ceremony at your Oregon Sports Hall of Fame. Great athletes, great Oregonians. From the Oregon Sports Hall of Fame is sponsored by Nike and by D.A. Davidson. Financial advice for the long run. Back in the 60s, sponsors took active roles in supporting their teams. Irv Lynn, owner of a Northeast Portland florist shop, was the coach and manager of the city's best known women's softball team for 28 years. He led them to national championships in 1944 and 1964. It was the first time in the Amateur Softball Association of America had chosen to play its annual World Series of Softball in the Deep South, and Orlando, Florida was the tournament site. That was back in 1964, long before Walt Disney had discovered Florida's Orange County. The Irv Lynn Florists would never forget their visit to the central Florida city, for it was there that they made softball history. I'm Carl Clough. I made the trip with the florists. It was a supremely confident florist team. 11 players, manager Irv Lynn, and coach Lois Williams. Imagine if you can, going to a world tournament with only two substitutes. Furthermore, the florists swept through a five-game tournament, winning four by shutouts, and only the nine starters played every minute of the games. Seven of the nine starters were named to either the all-tournament first or second team and pitcher Jackie Rice, who was credited with all the wins, was named the tournament MVP. This was Irv's third championship club during his 28-year reign as sponsor and manager of the Flores. And less than three months after his most recent achievement, Irv succumbed to a heart disease. He left a legacy of 1,164 wins, only 340 losses, 34 ties. His 64 team was certainly one of his best, with a 60, 16, and one record. When appraising this 77 game season, one should also recall that the team played 33 games on a 30 day cross country tour, extending into Connecticut and back across America. Truly a coast to coast junket. But what really distinguishes this florist team is its post playing days achievements. Our theme in 1964 was the impossible dream. You have just added the finale to that theme tonight, and we thank you. Irv M. and Jeannie Lind, without your continuous strong support of women's softball, we would not be here tonight. Your stylish, dedicated sponsorship was the envy of many teams and players throughout our nation. You always provided excellent coaching, positive examples involving the techniques, strategies, and mental aspects of winning softball and how they applied to our everyday life. We hope you realize how much you have contributed to our lives. Our deep appreciation to one of the greatest coaches and players in softball. Her expertise in softball techniques and strategies and in human relations enabled her to mold a widely diverse group of independent personalities into a precision unit on the field. I know without Lois Williams at the helm, we would not have achieved the impossible dream. Thank you. 
You know, John, since the 1950s, life has really changed for us, but, you know, the, the strive to dominate in team sports has really m remained kind of consistent. I think when you look at the common themes of the teams that are in the Oregon Sports Hall of Fame, the teams that have great success, you see great leadership at the top, uh, either a manager or somebody running the show there that, that really got it. Uh, you also see individuals who are willing to give up their own personal gain for the benefit of the team. And, and to me, there are great athletes in the Oregon Sports Hall of Fame, but when I look at the teams, what they collectively, what they brought together and, and what they achieved together, uh, it's really inspiring to me. Me too. Look for more stories and more lessons on future episodes of Great Athletes, Great Oregonians. Financial relationships built on loyalty.